If you hang around the chem lab long enough, you're gonna be asked to do a titration, or you'll need to do a titration. So I have this solution. It's a solution of hydrochloric acid, but I have a problem. The molarity of this solution is as yet unknown, and I might wanna know what the molarity of this solution is, how much acid is actually in here. You can't see it, it looks like regular water, so how do we do that? To do this, we do something called an acid-base titration. Now there's lots of different kinds of titrations out there. There's acid-base titrations, there's redox titrations, there's precipitation titrations, all kinds. And today I wanna to demonstrate a simple acid-base reaction, an acid-base titration, to show you the techniques that will help you do a good job with your own titrations. So what is a titration? A titration is a process by which you add a very accurate amount of a known chemical, something you know a lot about, maybe it's concentration, etc. And you're gonna add it to your unknown solution to find out something about it. Maybe that's the molarity of the solution. Maybe it's the pH at the equivalence point. Um, there's lots of things you could find out about a solution like this. And a titration is a method for doing that. We're gonna react this hydrochloric acid with some sodium hydroxide, which is a known molarity. And um, we're gonna use an acid-base indicator to let us know when we reach the equivalence point. Because if I can get to the point where I know exactly how much of this reacts with this, in a certain volume, I can find out the molarity of my acid. Now, in order to do a titration, you're gonna need some equipment. I've got here a couple of beakers. I've got a flask, you'll need at least one of those. I have my containers that have my uh, known and unknown solutions in them. But most importantly, I have this setup, which is a ring stand, a double burette clamp, and two burettes. Burettes like these are basically really long graduated cylinders <clears throat> that have markings on the side, and there's a little nozzle here on the bottom that you can use to open and close and add your titrant into your unknown solution. Be very careful with these. These are very expensive. They're made of glass. They have this tip at the end, which will snap if you bump it against anything. So first safety advice, do not rest it on its tip because it's guaranteed to snap on you. Now you might've noticed that when I first took this burette off the stand, it was upside down and now it's right side up. This one is still upside down and that is actually on purpose. We actually store burettes upside down and with the nozzle open when we're done with them and we rinse them out. And that will keep things from getting stuck inside of that tip and clogging up the tip for the next user. Now that we've got our burettes, the first thing we need to do is rinse them out and make sure that they are clean. We don't know who used these ahead of us and we don't know what they put inside of it. So it's always a good idea to rinse it with distilled water. So I'm gonna take this off. Now, one of my beakers, that I have here is going to be for waste. It's always a good idea to have a waste beaker here while you're titrating so that you don't have to keep running to the sink and back. And I'm taking this off and I'll squirt some distilled water in there, making sure that the nozzle is closed, this way is closed. And then I'll run some water through the tip to clean that out. And I can save a little bit of time by just dumping the rest of it this way. And we're gonna do that with both of our burettes. We'll make that closed. I like to spin the burette while it's filling just to kind of rinse off all the sides, drain a little bit through. And guys, now I have a problem. I just rinsed it out with water and there's little water left in here from droplets that fell down from above. And there's also water in the tip. And I want to get rid of that. I don't want that water in there because it will immediately dilute any acid or base or any other solution that I put in there. And so that would cause me error and I don't want any error. This next step is crucial for doing a good job on your titration. And by a good job, I mean an accurate result or maybe some congratulations from your professor or teacher or just the satisfaction of doing a job well done. After I rinsed it with water, I'm gonna give it a quick rinse with the solution that's gonna stay in the burette. I'm gonna add a little bit of it there. I'm going to drain some of it through and then I'm just gonna get rid of it. And I know it seems wasteful, but this ensures that any droplets that are still in here are now droplets of your titrant and not droplets of water that are gonna cause you error. I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing with this side. Even though my original flasks with my solutions in it are very large, I poured some of them into beakers. And that's because beakers are much easier to pour into a tiny hole like this. This is hydrochloric acid. We're going to drain it through. And again, 
dump that out. That is now waste and it's gonna go down the drain. Now you may have also noticed that when I was filling the burettes, I was not standing here with my beaker going like this. First of all, it's awkward to try to pour into that tiny hole above your head. And second of all, if some of it ever spills, which it inevitably will, guess where it's gonna go? It's probably gonna land on you, land on the countertop everywhere, and it's not a good situation. So when you do fill your burettes, you wanna take them off, hold them below eye level, hold them at an angle is the easy, easiest, and begin to fill them. Get this up close to the top. All right. And we'll go ahead and do the same with the other penchant. Once we've got our burettes filled, our first task is to take the initial volume of the solutions in the burette. And as a pro tip, I'm using an index card right behind it, so we get a nice clear view of the level. Of course, you want to read to the bottom of the meniscus. And also, you want to give as many digits of accuracy as you can. Most burettes are numbered from the top down, so you have to read the volumes from the top down. And this is in milliliters, and it's just below 0.6 and it's kind of in that space there. So I wanna estimate a digit from that space. So I'm gonna say 0 0.62 milliliters as the starting point for this one. And the second one with the hydrochloric acid in it, I'm gonna guess 0 0.60. So right now I know there's a whole bunch of people at home just starting to panic and you're going, no, why didn't you fill it all the way up to the zero? Why are you leaving it at 0 0.62? Well, the answer is it doesn't have to be at zero. What's really important is how much actually goes into my flask, not whether it starts at zero or something else. Now I know there's a lot of people out there, and I know a lot of them, who need it to be zero. Like there's a zero on that burette and it has to be at zero. And they'll spend a lot of time trying to make sure it's exactly zero with little droppers and things like that. You can save yourself some time if you can get over this by just filling it near the zero and writing down exactly what it says. Because at the end, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our final volume minus our initial volume, and then we'll get the difference, which is how much actually goes into the flask. So again, it doesn't have to be zero unless you really need it to be zero. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not judging. Now that we've got our burettes cleaned and filled and we've marked our initial volumes, we are ready to titrate. And the one that I'm interested in is the hydrochloric acid that's over here. I'm really interested in finding the molarity of that acid. As yet, it's unknown. And so I wanna get some of that analyte, is what we call it, into my flask. And so I've noted my initial volume and I'm just gonna open it up and let a whole bunch in. I'm gonna let it go to at least 25, somewhere between 25 and 30 mils per liter. I can always add more later if I want to. So now I'm just over 26. I'm not gonna write that down yet because I'm not done with my titration yet, but I've got my sample of my analyte in my flask. The whole key to a titration is adding just enough of your known solution to completely react what you have as your unknown. And in an acid-based titration like this, we call that the equivalence point. I need to know when I'm gonna be at the equivalence point because this solution is clear and that solution is clear and I, how am I gonna tell? That's what acid-based indicators are for. I have one here, it's a very common one you'll probably use right away. That's phenolphthalein. I'm just gonna add two to three drops. Doesn't matter if you get a little extra in there, uh, but that's the acid-based indicator. And this will change color when I get close and at the equivalence point. Right now it is clear because I know the phenothalein is clear in an acidic solution. But now I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna add sodium hydroxide until I get to the equivalence point. This is where the fun begins. And right now I'm just gonna open it up. Um, I don't see any pink color yet because we have a strong excess of the hydrochloric acid. But as I get closer to the equivalence point, I'm gonna see more and more of a pink color happening. And another pro tip, is to maybe use an index card or some white paper underneath so that it's very easy to see your color change. Okay, now the pink color is lasting a little bit longer. That means I'm getting close to the equivalence point. Let's raise this up a tiny bit. Okay, the longer the pink color lasts or whatever color change is happening in your flask, the closer you are to the equivalence point. And you wanna to get to the point where you added just enough so that one drop gets you your color change. One thing I like to do is kind of get it set up so we get these little drippy drips going on. And keep swirling while you do it. True professionals will swirl with one hand and work the nozzle with the other one. We're getting close. We're getting close. And I'm 
gonna stop there. Ooh, okay, so I've added probably a little too much sodium hydroxide here. It's a little bit too dark of a pink. I want it the, just the moment that the pink color happens. Now in a titration like this, you have a way to fix that. We can actually just go over here and add another drop. Let's try a drop. There's a drop. And now I'm back to being clear. That was one drop of acid that changed from pink back to clear. And I'm just gonna go back over here and see if I can get one little drop out of here. Sometimes, ooh, it's hanging right on there. Watch, watch, then you can just touch the side and let it run down. Oh, that is, ah, that's so satisfying. So I'm gonna stop here. And at this point, now is when I'm going to read my final volumes on my burettes. I could go back and forth all day going from pink to clear to pink to clear, which is also kind of fun. But once I'm done, what really matters is those final volumes minus those initial volumes to find out exactly how much went into my flask. For those of you following along at home, this is the sodium hydroxide and we're gonna call it 27.10. And over here on the hydrochloric acid side, let's call that 26.78 milliliters. So now that I have both the initial and final values for my acid and base in this titration, my trial is done and I'm gonna go ahead and clean up. It's always a good idea to clean up at the end of your titrations. So we can just put everything into our waste container. Again, just a reminder to make sure to rinse out your burettes as a courtesy to the next user. Rinse it out with some good old distilled water. Drain it through, empty it out, and then open it up and store it upside down on your burette stand. So there you have it, a simple acid-base titration. I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the second burette and I'll see you next time.